Um, my name is Ricky Chang. I am an internal medicine doctor, um, but I have fortunately been trained um, also in acupuncture, and currently I am doing an East-West fellowship at UCLA, and I'm currently leading the project and try to bring over East-West medicine to the Tsuji Health Centers. So stay tuned. That will be coming up later on this year. So today we'll be talking about uh, these topics that Clarence have gone over. So we're going to go over some basic uh, flu uh, knowledge. We'll be talking a little bit about the flu vaccine and some differences between cold flu and COVID-19. Um, we also, you know, this is a very important topic for a lot of people because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, a lot of us either have family members or friends that have been infected with COVID. So we'll be talking about what to do if you or your family is po has tested positive for COVID. Uh, we'll be talking about some updates on current the COVID-19 vaccine. And for those who have been um, infected with COVID in the past, um, some self-care ways to help yourself recover after COVID. So what is the flu or influenza? Uh, so a flu is a contagious respiratory illness caused by the influenza virus that infect the nose, throat, and sometimes in the lungs. Uh, you can have varying degrees of symptoms. It could be from mild, which is severe, and at times it could actually lead to death. Uh, and some of the symptoms that you can associate with um, a flu could be fever, or feeling feverish and having chills. You could have a cough, sore throat, um, running or stuffy nose. You could have muscle aches or body aches, also known as myalgias. You could have headaches, which is overall fatigue, uh, being really tired. Uh, some people may have vo uh, vomiting or diarrhea, but this is more common in children than adults. And just remember, just because sometimes you have the flu doesn't mean you can always have a fever. So the influenza virus, there are actually four types. Um, so there's influenza A, B, C, and D. Um, and usually the influenza A and B are the ones that cause uh, the flu season, like the uprising flu cases, influenza A or B. Um, and the reason why we're talking about this is because, you know, even though we're in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, the flu is still around. Uh, so we have to be careful not to get the flu. So talking about the flu is actually more important than ever because you don't want to get infected with the flu and also with COVID-19 at the same time. It could be very detrimental for your health. Um, and going back to this slide, you can see that um, flu A, uh, causes the pandemics like the H1N1 on the top box that you see or H3N2 which is the Hong Kong flu and then the flu B subtype are usually not as serious as uh, influenza type A. Uh, so this is just a picture to kind of show you uh, the influenza pandemic that has occurred over time. So you can see that at the very end on the left side of the timeline, the Spanish flu, which killed the most people in humankind history, uh, was in 1918. And then recently we have the pandemic of 2009 of influenza, the H1N1, which is also called the swine flu, and it caused over 200,000 deaths. Um, and going backwards, you see that the Asian influenza in 15, uh, 1957 killed over 1 million people, and the Hong Kong flu in 1968 killed about over a million deaths. Uh, this picture um, kind of gives you a timeline of history also of uh, different pandemics. I like this graphic because it kind of shows you, based on uh, the number of deaths, how big the size of the, the graphic is. So you can see that um, the Spanish flu in the green um, in the middle killed 40 to 50 million people. Um, and then if you go a little bit towards the bottom, you see that the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the swine flu in 2009 to 2010 killed over about 200,000 people. Um, and now on the very bottom, you see the novel coronavirus. So this graphic was probably made back in the middle of last year. They only estimated around that time killed about 4,700 people. But as of today, as of yesterday, uh, the worldwide deaths of COVID-19 has killed 2.06 million people. And in the U.S. alone, uh, over 410,000 people now. So this is a serious uh, detrimental issue COVID-19 has caused around the world. 
Um, and this is to tell you kind of a, a, the current uh, status of our flu season. Uh, so there's a lot of lines on this graphic, but if you focus on the bottom where there's a, um, a triangle, uh, the red triangles, that's the current season of 2020 to 2021. You can tell that compared to the green line, which is the 2019 to 2020 season, you can tell that up to date on the, on the bottom number one, the week number one, you can tell that it hasn't been a spike of the flu this year, which is a good thing. I think uh, a lot of the, it's probably attributed to uh, wearing a face mask. But even though, you know, the trend is the flu season this year is low, it doesn't mean that you still cannot get the flu. Um, now we're going to move on and talk about a little bit about the flu vaccination. So this is from the CDC. Uh, so from 2019 to 2020, on the top of the graph, it estimates how many flu cases there will be. So they were estimating from a previous year that this year we're going to have 38 million flu cases and about 400,000 flu hospitalizations due to the flu and estimated 22,000 deaths. But however, on the bottom of the graph, you see that if 50% of the U.S. population um, six months or older get the vaccine during the flu season, you can actually cut down the hospitalization down to 1,500 people and the deaths down to 6,300 people. So you can tell that you know, there's a dra dramatic decrease in the deaths and the people who are infected with the flu with a proper flu vaccination um, during the flu season. And this number is all estimated, so we'll find out more um, at the end of the year what the actual numbers are this year. Um, so each season, the flu vaccine, um, it contains uh, one influenza type A, one influenza type A again. So there's two uh, type A's in the flu vaccination. It also it contains either one or two uh, influenza B. And this year, um, 2020 and 21 vaccine contains two strands of uh, influenza A, which is the H1N1, uh, which is from the, um, the swine flu, and the H3N2. Um, and also it contains a strand B, uh, from the Victoria lineage that they found that was most common, so they put in uh, this year's vaccine. Um, so overall, people usually ask, what is the effectiveness of having a flu vaccine? Um, so for what we know right now from 2019 to 2020, the overall um, effectiveness is about 39-40%. Um, but specifically for influenza A, it was about 30%, and for influenza B, is 45%. So what does this mean? So you know, people think 39% is not a very high number, but overall thinking about it, if you contract the influenza, you have a 40% chance less likely to develop severe influenza illness and symptoms compared to those that get the flu vaccine. So even though the flu vaccination um, season started back in September, October, and November, it's still not too late. Uh, we're still in the winter season, this can up uh, last up until ap April to May. So if you want to get your flu vaccine, if you haven't had it yet, you can go to this website, uh, vaccinefinder.org, uh, to find the uh, nearest location to get the flu vaccine. Um, and I get this question a lot, you know, about the flu vaccine. So currently, because the COVID-19 uh, vaccine is out, people usually ask, can I get the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine at the same time? And um, the answer is no, you cannot, because there's really not a lot of, a lot of statistical data or scientific evidence to get at the same time. So usually they recommend that you get the flu vaccine uh, 14 days before or after you get the COVID-19 vaccine, um, because we don't know if it's dangerous to get two at the same time. And usually sometimes there are people are getting some um, symptoms from the COVID vaccine, so we wanna make sure that you don't combine the two together. Um, so next, I have a, a little table to kind of tell you the difference between cold, flu, and COVID-19. So this uh, graphic, just on the top of the, the table, just to kind of give you an overview. So the full circle with the green dots, that means the symptoms are very common. The half circle means that symptoms sometimes occur. Um, and you can tell that the dotted circle means that symptoms are rare, and then if it has an X over it means that it, you don't really see these symptoms um, um, in these uh, illnesses. So you can tell that if you go down COVID-19 and the flu column, you can tell a lot of their symptoms are very similar to each other. The only one that's very different is loss of taste or smell. 
Um, that's not common in the flu, cold, or seasonal allergies. So if you develop that symptom, you know, you should be tested for COVID or contact your healthcare provider. Um, so a lot of times with flu and COVID-19, it's difficult to tell because you can, all, you can get a fever, you can get a cough, you can get uh, tiredness, and also um, nausea or vomiting, which is not very uh, common. But just be careful, if you do get these symptoms, you should get tested to see if you have a flu or COVID-19, especially if you've been around other people that have exposure to COVID-19. And you can tell that in seasonal allergies, uh, it's very uncommon or rarely ever happens for you to have a uh, uh, body ache, fever, or lost taste of smell, or other symptoms are usually more upper respiratory tract um, symptoms like running, sneezy nose, watery eyes. So next we'll be talking about what happens if you or your family member is infected with COVID-19. And I know a lot of people are knowing people or in their families, you know, with COVID-19, and what should you do? First, don't panic, stay calm, because I know people, you know, hear lots of uh, bad news um, from the media, Facebook, you know, a lot of deaths from COVID-19. I know a lot of people have died from COVID-19, uh, but just to let you know that most people that have COVID-19, that have mild illnesses, and they can recover at home without any medical care. Um, if you're tested positive or your family member is tested positive, make sure you guys stay home, whether if you have symptoms or not. Um, and then just to kind of also think back in the last two days, at least, uh, any type of close contacts that you have been with, that you need to let them know that you've been tested positive for COVID uh, so they can get tested too, so it's to protect them and also protect yourself. And if you're staying at home, make sure that you have uh, ventilation in your home. If it's safe, open up your windows and doors to have airflow. With airflow, it decreases the amount of um, COVID-19 can accumulate in the air. Um, and then if, if your family member or yourself is infected, make sure that if you have a specific room uh, dedicated for them to sleep, so it's to decrease the contact for that person. Um, if you have a separate bathroom um, that he can use separately, do that. But if not, that's okay. Just make sure you disinfect after each use. If that person was infected with COVID, to uh, disinfect that area. Uh, and then overall, I cannot stress importantly, do not leave your home. Visit public areas, even if you don't have symptoms, and only accept to get medical care. If you need to see a doctor or other essential things, you can do that. And also stay in touch with your doctor so they can monitor you um, over telemedicine, over the phone to make sure you're doing okay. So when you're affected with um, COVID-19, you want to make sure some of these people who are at high risk of developing severe illnesses um, are people with cancer, chronic kidney disease, if you have any type of lung problem like COPD or asthma, um, if you have heart disease, heart failure, if you have type 2 diabetes, or you have uh, immunocompromised state, meaning that your immune system is very low, um, not the same as normal people, such as if you had an organ transplant. Um, people who are obese with a BMI less over than 30, but less than 40, but also people with morbid obesity, we have seen to develop severe uh, illnesses with COVID. Um, also, people who are pregnant who are infected with COVID tend to develop more severe symptoms. Um, so if anybody in your household have these risk factors, you should assume that you know, you're also high risk because if you're young and you don't have any medical problems, you could still contract COVID-19 outside of the household and bring it back to your family member who are have high risk for developing um, bad COVID. Um, and then if these individuals who are high risk, if they are tested positive or develop symptoms, you want to make sure you contact their healthcare provider uh, right away so to make sure that you know, everything is monitored correctly so they don't get worse if they need to seek out any medical attention. Um, so how do you care for someone, you know, a family member with COVID-19 at home? Um, so first of all, you should not be the person with those risk factors that can develop severe illness. You want to make sure that person who is sick is drinking lots of fluids every day and getting plenty of rest. Um, and then you might want to have some over-the-counter medication kind of stocked, like Tylenol, ibuprofen, any type of cough medicine on hand uh, just to kind of help with their symptoms if it's really bothering them. Um, if you guys do eat, make sure that person who's infected with COVID eat in a separate room or area so you know, to decrease your contact. 
Uh, make sure that when you do their dishes or utensils, you're using, uh, wearing gloves and using hot water to disinfect. And absolutely do not share any dishes, cups, glass, silverware, towels, bedding with the person uh, who's infected with COVID. And also don't share electronics like cell phones, iPads, or computers because they have touched the surfaces and it can pass it on to other people. Um, and then at times, if you do have, you know, contact in the same room, make sure that person who's sick is wearing a mask. I cannot stress, wearing a mask is very important. Um, and you also want to monitor their symptoms. Even if you don't have the risk factor to develop uh, severe COVID, it doesn't mean that you won't. There's still a small chance of that happening. So you want to watch out for these symptoms. If you start developing shortness of breath, which is trouble breathing, uh, difficulty catching your breath, um, if you feel chest pain or persistent pressure in your chest, um, you have you know onset of new confusion, or if your family member notice like, hey, he's not acting correctly or she, um, and then we have altered mental state, which is extra drowsiness, and you cannot wake that person up. Um, and also, if you notice any type of uh, bluish color in their lips or face, that's a sign of hypoxia, meaning that they're lacking oxygen in their body. You want to seek medical attention immediately. Usually, you should call 911 or put them to an emergency room as soon as possible. But make sure that this is not the only symptoms. You want to make sure that if you do have a symptom that's, you know, uh, lingering and getting worse, still call your medical professional to seek out uh, accurate opinion and diagnosis and to how to help you. Um, so there is additional monitoring you can do at home uh, by monitoring your blood oxygenation using a pulse oximeter. Uh, so based on the National Institute of Health, uh, the current target oxygenation rate uh, range is between, for COVID-19 is between 92 to 96%. Uh, so you can buy these pulse oximeter, uh, any type of uh, um, drugstore like CVS, Walgreens, they all sell it. You can probably buy it on Amazon, um, and they're fairly cheap, 20 to $30. So you want to make sure that when you put it on your finger, that you're getting a good reading because it actually measures your pulse and your blood oxygenation, the pulse ox, the SPO2 is what they abbreviated on the machine. Uh, make sure that the waveform that you see in the picture is very regular. Sometimes, you know, make sure that you wait until the waveform is regular before you get the accurate reading. So the SPO2 stands for the how much oxygen percent is in your blood. And then the beats per minute is your heart rate. Um, so if you are getting consistently readings below 92%, you want to make sure you call your doctor or seek a medical advice to see what you should do. Um, if your SPO2 falls below 88% or consistently falling below that or lower, you want to seek immediate medical advice. That means that your oxygen level is very low and that could be developing worsening respiratory uh, problems with COVID-19. Uh, just to be aware, sometimes you can have falsely low readings uh, because if you have really cold hands, um, people who have cold hands in the winter, make sure your hands are warm before you use the pulse ox because it can give you a low reading inaccurately. And people with Ronald's, uh, Ronald's phenomena where people, people, people's fingers turn blue or uh, purple in cold, make sure you don't have that before you use the machine. If you have any type of nail polish or artificial nails, make sure you remove it before using the machine to test your oxygen level. So the next question is, you know, if you are infected with COVID-19, when is it okay to be around other people? Um, so this is from the CDC recommendation. So you can be around other people after 10 days since your first symptoms appear, but also that you have 24 hours, one day with no fever, um, or without taking any type of um, over-the-counter medication to reduce your fever like Tylenol or Ibuprofen, uh, and to make sure your other COVID symptoms are also improving uh, before you, you could be around other people, and also still follow the guidelines of social distancing and wearing a mask. Um, some people who are infected with COVID do have lost taste or smell. Sometimes these symptoms can actually last for weeks or months um, after recovery. Uh, if you still have these symptoms, uh, you can still see other people. That will take some time to come back. Um, so if you're tested positive for COVID, but you don't have any symptoms, I still recommend that you stay home and self-isolate for 10 days um, before you can uh, go, or go out. Uh, but you, this used to be 14 days. I know CDC changed it recently to 10 days, but I just, for my personal opinion, maybe probably safer to stay isolated for 14 days before going out again. Um, the CDC has lots of resources and a lot of tips on how to take care of people if you have family members who are sick. Um, if, sometimes if you're the caregiver with children and you are affected with COVID, what you should do. So there are links right here on this page. Um, that gives you um, 
more recommendations and tips. And there's cleaning and disinfecting uh, tips also as well on the CDC. So check these uh, websites out. Um, I will be giving out a handout, a PDF, um, upload it. Um, you guys can download this later for your uh, resources. So if you need to look at these links again, um, it's accessible to you guys. Next, we're going to move on to the COVID vaccine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the COVID vaccine, and I'm going to do a lot of uh, frequently asked questions about the vaccine, because I know a lot of people are still having lots of questions about COVID uh, vaccine and how safe it is and things like that. So um, in history, there's been different types of um, vaccinations. So there's the life attenuated, uh, there's a DNA on the first column, RNA, which is what um, COVID vaccine was uh, derived from. It's called messenger RNA. Um, the other columns, I won't focus too much on that. So the current, we have um, the Moderna vaccine, also the Pfizer vaccine, and they're all derived from the messenger RNA. So most questions that people have is really how effective is COVID-19 vaccine? So based on their clinical trial, phase three clinical trials, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine are 95 and 94.1% effective, respectively, at preventing symptomatic illness from COVID-19 um, after both doses are received. And this is according to FDA as well. Um, and then a lot of people worry about, should I get the mRNA vaccine because this is a new technology or should I not? Even though the mRNA technology is first time used in a vaccination, but the technology has been studied for many, many years by many companies. Um, they just you know, accelerated the process of creating this vaccine um, to have the vaccine made so quickly. But the safety and the efficacy are very um, well known. Uh, so it's not any more dangerous than other types of vaccinations that we have, like the flu vaccine. Um, and most people are saying, you know, the vaccine are made within the year. So was it made too quickly? Do I need to worry about that? Um, but given the importance of COVID-19 pandemic, you know, now that over 2 million people have died from it, um, the vaccine experts focus their time in developing this safe, effective vaccine. They use pre-existing vaccine models to help them that they've been studying for many years to develop this vaccine so quickly. Um, they follow the same rules and the guidelines as, as other medications and also vaccine that have been approved previously, such as antibiotics or the flu shot. So some people say, well, if I get the COVID vaccine, do I get COVID? Do I get infected with COVID? And the answer is no. Um, because the mRNA vaccine is not a life virus, it's just a messenger um, that's derived from the uh, COVID-19. Um, so it will not give you uh, COVID-19. So the mRNA just contains genetic instructions, which was in, uh, injected into your body, tells you to make uh, antibodies. And it, it, it kind of uh, signals your immune system to make antibodies to mount a response. So you have memory cells later to kill off the infection if you are infected with COVID-19. And this little piece of mRNA, it cannot replicate itself. It cannot go into a cells and replicate, which is what a live uh, virus would do. So no worries, you not get COVID from the vaccination. Um, what are the vaccine's ingredients? So I just said that it doesn't have any live virus that causes COVID-19. It also doesn't contain eggs or any preservatives. It does have some other like lipids to stabilize the pH of the vaccine so it doesn't um, go bad. But other than that, the components are very safe. Um, so some people say, well, most people don't die from COVID-19, so why should I get the vaccine? Uh, as I talked about before, as of January this year, COVID just in the U.S. alone has killed over 400,000 people. This is a lot more deaths than any other viruses we have seen that we also routinely vaccinate against, such as the influenza. Uh, influenza usually causes 24,000 to 62,000 deaths in, a, uh, in the year in the U.S. So this is much, much more than just the flu. So you should get vaccinated when it's available to you. Um, so also, you want to get the vaccination because it could prevent you developing severe illness from the COVID-19 infection. Um, you don't want to develop any long-term complications, we'll talk about a little bit later, because uh, the vaccine will save lives and also decrease the likelihood of you developing a very long-term complication, like kidney problems, um, lung problems, or heart issues from COVID-19. So the vaccine is very important in, in doing that. So overall, is the vaccine safe? 
Uh, so both Pfizer and Moderna have undergone rigorous review um, in which FDA has authorized for emergency use. And I know there's a lot of skepticism about the COVID-19 vaccine among the people of color um, because of historical medical racism, experimentation on people of color. Uh, but that's not true because all the clinical trials they've done include all um, people with all different races, ethnic backgrounds. Um, and the vaccine was found to be effective for all uh, races and ethnic backgrounds. There's no specific people. I've heard recently a rumor that it works less effectively on Asian population, which is not true because that was also included in the trial. Um, but the people who are in the trial will be continue to follow for the next two years to develop so they can track them and monitor them if they develop any um, complications from that. And just to kind of let people know, social media is everywhere these days, uh, Facebook, so, um, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I've just noticed since the beginning of the pandemic that fake news travels very fast. And the average rate it travels is six times faster than the actual truth. So when you hear something online on Instagram, you see a video, it doesn't mean it's true. I want you to pause and think about it. Just because one person has an opinion about something doesn't mean it's always accurate. A lot of times people are just opinionating things based on what they believe. But make sure you always use trusted websites like the CDC or any major health organization's website to find the most accurate and current information that's scientifically sound. And that's not just based on biases. So the current vaccine distribution, um, we're in phase 1A. Uh, meaning that most of the healthcare workers on the front line, other health workers behind the scenes are getting vaccinated. In the next phase, um, we're going to phase 1B, 1C, and phase 2. So currently, we're in phase 1B. However, uh, we just started this phase uh, in LA County. Uh, it's not all uh, available to everybody yet for people 75 years or older, but they actually changed it recently. Um, so the green dot, meaning that it's, uh, it's, it's in action, it's eligible. So people who are 65 years and older, you can actually go to the website um, on the bottom you see on the page where you can just Google LA County COVID-19 vaccine. You'll get the, to the website and then just find, um, there's a, a button on the website to make an appointment. Um, I did actually go through the process. They actually, a lot of it are full, but there are availabilities. So if you wanna, if you're over 65 years older, if you wanna get the vaccine, go ahead and go online today to get registered. So what happens after you have COVID? You know, most people who have uh, mild illness, they recover with no issues. But a lot of times, you know, uh, people with uh, high risk factors, they can have lingering COVID symptoms um, how do you take care of yourself? How do you recover? Um, so this is just a, a, a study done in the UK. They surveyed about 200 people who were infected with COVID. Um, and they found that 70% of people had impairments in one organ damage four months after the initial symptoms that developed. And in most of the times they have fatigue as the number one uh, symptom, muscle aches, they could have lingering shortness of breath, headaches, and sometimes, you know, they can have lingering heart problems, lung problems, and also kidney problems as well. So it doesn't matter if you're older or younger, you can develop long uh, COVID symptoms. And this just uh, gives you some basic um, common symptoms that people feel. So these people are uh, called long COVID or long haulers that have uh, developed these long lasting symptoms that doesn't go away after they recover from COVID. So the number one symptom is fatigue shortness of breath, you have joint pain, people can have long lasting chest pain where a dry cough doesn't go away. And for those that have the loss of smell or taste that can linger for months, uh, weeks to months. Um, so then how do you recover? So I'm gonna be talking about some integrative approaches to help your body recover. Um, so I do have been recently seeing a couple of COVID patients that have been trying to help They have lingering pain and after they had COVID. So we use different type of things at UCLA to help them recover and to kind of replete their body's uh, store to back to a baseline. Um, so we focus on the body. You know, after having COVID, it's a very stressful process. A lot of times people feel very tense and they can have muscle pain. Uh, we call it myofascial pain or soft tissue pain. 
So we focus a lot on stretching and making sure your body gets relaxed every day. So stretching is very important. We tell every patient um, that I see to stretch every day. Uh, there's, we use other tools like acupuncture and a TENS unit, which I'll kind of talk to you a little bit about later. And then uh, also very important is your sleep. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, people don't sleep enough and make sure you develop a good sleep hygiene every day. You're sleeping seven to eight hours a day, every day. And make sure you go into bed around the same time every day, waking up around the same time every day, even on the weekends. And also making sure to get proper good sleep, make sure you relax, right, relaxing before bedtime. Uh, one of the ways you can relax at bedtime is doing foot soaks at night to kind of help circulation and improve your sleep quality. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about mind and body and movement. Uh, so after COVID, um, a lot of times it depletes a lot of energy uh, storage from the inside of the body. So you want to practice uh, restorative exercises like meditation or restorative yoga and also qigong. And then later on, we'll be talking a little bit about nutrition. Uh, so qi and yin is a uh, Chinese medicine terminology. So qi is the invisible energy in your body. Uh, and yin is sort of the storage of the reserve your body has. Uh, you want to make sure you replete these things after COVID because COVID takes a lot of stores from your body to fight off the infection. So it beca become, people become qi and yin deficient. So qi and yin deficiency is what we see a lot uh, with uh, people after COVID. And they usually develop symptoms like lingering fatigue, shortness of breath, or a dry cough. Um, they usually have a lot of lingering heat, um, meaning like inflammation in the body. So they can have dry mouth, thirst, you can have heart palpitations, excessive sweating, poor appetite. You can still have fevers that comes and goes. You have a dry cough, uh, you can have dry tongue, just meaning that the heat is kind of burn off all the fluid in the body, so you become very fluid deficient. So the purpose of um, using Chinese medicine to kind of recover is to tonify, where we boost your qi back in the body and to nourish yin in the body. And this will also clear away heat, which is the inflammation, and try to replete your body fluids. So one of the ways we can do that is through nutrition. As, as Hippocrates said in the past, let food be, by, be thy medicine. So you want to focus eating more soups and stews uh, that are very cooked. Uh, the reason behind that is because a lot of times um, your body's GI tract is not very functional at optimum after COVID. You want to make things that's easier to digest. Uh, you can incorporate some bone broth. American ginseng is a good chi tonic. Uh, lily bulbs, uh, white woody or mushrooms, goji berry, which is a good ying tonic. Uh, Chinese yam, which is zong yao in Chinese. Uh, red dates, hong zao, jujube dates. Uh, tangerine peel is good for cough. Uh, you can include dandelion and coit seed, which is job tears. Uh, that can get rid of dampness. You can also add bitter melon, which uh, decreases your um, heat in the body. And the meat that you can try to eat a little bit more is duck. Duck is a cooling meat. You can also decrease some of the inflammation in the body. Um, in terms of fruits and vegetables, uh, Asian pears are very good uh, to replenish uh, uh, qi in the lungs. You can uh, steam the pears and add a little bit of honey uh, for flavor. You can add lotus roots, water chestnuts, asparagus, dandelion, and lots of root vegetables. Root vegetables are good uh, qi and yin tonics for the body. You can add carrots, a different type of yams, radishes like the daikon radish, like the Japanese daikon radish. And overall, if you still have a lot of heat symptoms that I described earlier, you want to stay away from foods that's very warming or spicy like chili, pepper, ginger, green onions. Um, garlic or other hot or warming foods because you don't want to add fire on top of fire because you can get more symptoms that way. And after COVID, you know, it's natural for your lung to be very depleted. So your qi in the lung can become very deficient and also your spleen. So your spleen system in the Chinese medicine, you know, governs your digestion. It also governs your blood. Um, so sometimes people can have shortness of breath and the fatigue, weakness, which we talked about before, or poor appetite. And they can have a lot of issues after they eat, like bloating. They can have nausea, which is weakness in their bowel movement. And they can have loose stools. These are all just telling you signs that your GI tract is very lacking um, in qi. We want to boost the qi back into your spleen and your lungs. Um, and to invigorate the spleen and reduce dampness. So some common things you can eat. Um, a lot of this stuff you can see is very... Um, the same thing as I talked about previously for qi and yin deficiency. So American ginseng, astragalus, uh, the koi seed, which is a job tears, Chinese yam, you can add hawthorn berries, 
lotus seeds, tangerine peels. I'm not going to read the whole thing because uh, this will be available for you guys to look at later. Um, some meats you want to focus on um, chicken, lamb, and beef. Lamb is a warming um, type of meat. So if you do have a lot of heat symptoms, I will avoid lamb altogether. Um, but this will be something you can try. Uh, overall, you want to make sure you avoid cold and raw foods like salads because raw foods are very hard for the body to digest. It requires a lot of chi energy to digest these foods. So that's why you want to cook these foods in like stews or soups so they're easier to digest. You want to avoid things like Napa cabbage, which is kind of, it's a cold uh, vegetable. It's also difficult to digest. Also avoiding seafood because seafood comes from the sea, so they're cold by nature. Um, so that's stuff you want to try to avoid as you're recovering from COVID. And a lot of times after COVID, we call this liver chi stagnation, meaning that because of stress, your chi is not moving, it's stagnant. Um, so sometimes people can develop a lot of mental um, problems like depression or, you know, just mood, mood um, being feeling down, you have anxiety or stress. Because going through COVID, if you're very severely ill, if you're hospitalized, it's a very traumatic experience for a lot of people. They can have a lot of fear, they can become very irritable on top of the fatigue and insomnia and having poor appetite. So some of these foods and teas that I listed there could help um, kind of help the chi and blood move in the body. So, you know, rose flower tea is good, jasmine tea, uh, a lot of other flowers like chrysanthemum tea. You can add orange peels to your tea, uh, grapefruit, daikon radish, hawthorn all these things are good. You can mix it uh, boiling water to make hot teas out of it, or you can put it in your soups. Um, to add more chi into the body. Um, and all, a lot of times, if you're feeling a lot of anxiety, you know, depression, the mind and body has a very strong connection. So you want to practice things like mindfulness. There's lots of apps that I put in a handout for you guys. You can download, um, like Calm or Insight Timer. You can use things every night to do some meditation to help mindfulness and to kind of calm the mind, because when your mind is calm, it'll help your body also get better. Uh, you can practice restorative yoga or qigong. And some people who are interested in herbal medicines uh, from Chinese medicine, uh, I just suggest that you uh, contact a, a, a practitioner that are experienced in treating COVID patients. They can give you the right formula. Just don't go out there and buy a formula that someone recommend to you because everyone's body type is different. Their pattern's different. You want to make sure you take the right herbal formula for your own body type to make sure you're doing the right thing. Because if you buy the wrong formula, you can actually exacerbate and make your symptoms worse. Uh, here are some more tools that you can use uh, for yourself for, um, to kind of help your body recover. One of the which is at using acupressure massage. Uh, I'll be handing out a, a separate brochure on this. Uh, so you can use your hand to massage these points. So LI4, Hegu is on your hand right here. Um, you can have Mei Guan, which is uh, located right here. And stomach 36, which is located on your um, shin bone. Next to your shin bone, you can uh, see the diagram in your brochure. So these areas are good. You can massage one to minutes each time um, at a time. Use your thumb. You can use your fingers to massage. Uh, there's also uh, points on your arm, uh, LI10, which is around right here around your elbow area. I um, mean, lung 1, which is right below your collarbone. This is the area to fit the massage to help um, move the chi in your lungs. Um, and then a TENS unit, that's actually very helpful. I recommend everybody that I see in my clinic to buy a TENS unit. I just bought a TENS unit as an example. So it comes in like a little box and it has wires on it. Usually it comes with pads that you can use and these pads are reusable and once they uh, become uh, not sticky anymore, you can buy replacement ones. You can buy this on Amazon. They have lots of different TENS units. So a TENS unit, you can use it starting once to twice a day, 20 to 30 minutes a day and go up to 60 minutes each time. There's no harm using it hours a day. So what it does, it uses electricity to stimulate uh, your muscles or acupuncture points to help move the blood. And I listed some of the, um, the acupuncture points that I listed for the massage areas, the same thing, you can use that. And one of the things, if you have a lot of GI symptoms, you can use pads along uh, your stomach next to your belly button uh, and above and below your belly button as well. You can look up these points. And then also, uh, to restore your energy back in the body, you want to practice a lot of exercises that, you know, restore energy. And one of which a lot of people have been um, doing in China when they're infected with COVID is Qigong or Tai Chi. And in particular, a lot of people did the eight brocades, Ba Duan Jing. Um, and also just uh, doing some deep breathing exercises throughout the day will help your body relax. You want to avoid overall high intensity exercises like weight training 
example, high intensity interval training, which is very popular in the Western culture. But sometimes if you've already been depleted from COVID-19, you don't want to deplete more energy. You want to try to restore the energy back slowly before you go back into those exercises. Um, so this is just a two-pager that we will um, upload for you guys to download about the TENS unit. Here's a picture next to it to see where you, where you can place the pads. Uh, the example that I gave is called the 10 7000 you can buy on Amazon. I'm not endorsing this product. There's lots of different ones you can buy on Amazon. Um, but this is just an example, and there's some instructions you can have if you have any questions. Um, this you can download from our um, UCLA website. This is a two-pager we put together in a how to prevent yourself from getting sick during flu season, even COVID, because you know, you want to make sure you wash your hands, avoid touching your nose and mouth. Uh, most importantly, you want to keep warm. Make sure you keep your neck warm, your belly warm, and your legs warm. Because um, in Chinese medicine, that's very important. You want to actually catch a cold, um, literally. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. And in the handout, you'll see that there are some acupuncture points. You can use different ways. You can use your hand to simulate these points. You can use a hair dryer. Just be mindful. Don't do it too close to the skin. You can cause burns. Um, and on the second page, there's some recipes that we recommend. And also, if you're interested in taking some vitamins like zinc, vitamin C, and vitamin D, there are some um, doses you can take. Just make sure that if you do take these supplements, make sure you consult your physician to make sure you're okay to take them. Um, here's some resources. Uh, you can check out, if you go to our UCLA website for Center for East West Medicine, the Explore IM on the first link, there's lots of different things you can find on there, and the self-care tips that I just gave, the two-pager, and there's some brochures on acupressure. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. Hope you guys learned something and how to keep yourself healthy during flu and COVID season. Thank you so much for being with us and participating in this Healthy Community Workshop. We will see you next time. Thank you. Please stay safe and healthy.